and I'm delighted to introduce uh, Mary Larkin to you. So we've had the, the policy input from Elaine, uh, and now we're going to move into, uh, into research. A fantastic question for the presentation, where to now for, for carer research? So Mary, over to you. Thank you. Well, I was very pleased to be with you today, um, and I'm going to talk to you about a study that myself and a colleague at the University of Kent, Anderson Milnes, some of you will know her, um, did about uh, trying to get a better understanding about the generation of knowledge in carer research. Um, we've, we've written it up, waiting to hear um, back from peer reviewers, um, so I, I can't tell you where it's published yet, um, but um, I'm sure we can get that information to you if you're interested afterwards. So what I'm going to do today um, is just try and give you an overview of this work. I'm going to start by uh, putting it in context and then um, talking about our aims and methods. And we found, um, without wanting to spoil the surprise too early on, we found there were two research paradigms within this body of knowledge. So I'm going to talk about those two um, and then reflect on whether the knowledge we've got in care research is actually fit for purpose. You know, is, it, is it meeting the needs that we need it to meet, particularly um, in the current climate? And then I shall move on to um, uh, draw a few conclusions and, um, and I'd welcome your, your comments um, at the end. Helena and I had a quick discussion about questions. I think it, so that I can get the whole story over to you, um, I'll take questions at the end if that's all right, um, because this doesn't sort of fall into neat slots. I've, I've got to kind of keep going and I'll forget what I'm saying as well. So um, I'd, rather, I'd rather do it that way. So in terms of the uh, context, I've recently led on an ESRC uh, seminar series uh, about carers. There were four seminars and they were held between um, October 2012 and they finished in September 2013. <coughs> and these seminars um, aimed to contribute to the development of a coherent evidence base about policy, services, and, and interventions within health and social care that improve life, um, the quality of life for carers and those they support. And during the course of these seminars, it became clear that obviously much has been written about carers and caring over the past 30 years. And although um, there's a lot around, there's actually been limited critical analysis of the evidence base and the sort of knowledge that it's generated. So um, as part of addressing um, this, the lack of critical analysis and, and, and analysis, and, uh, analysis, analysis of the knowledge generation, gen, generation in care research, uh, myself and Alison, and although I was a principal investigator for the carers seminars, Alison was very closely involved with them um, and was very supportive. We we decided to undertake a critical interpretive synthesis. Don't worry, I will explain why that is um, of the nature of carer related research, and we've we've done it pretty recently. Uh, we did it between July and October. That was our summer job um, last summer. Um, and, um, and as I say, we have written it up but, and uh, for publication, but we're waiting to hear back from the peer reviewers. And obviously, it's timely for the reasons we've heard um, so far this morning. Carers are growing in number. It's a universe, rapidly, rapidly becoming a universal experience. Um, and there's a huge range of policy initiatives around carers and mainstreaming carers um, at the moment. And. We also wanted to, in doing the review, we wanted to start a debate about uh, carer research and the sort of knowledge we've got as a result of that. So in, some, in many ways, we're actually kind of trying to throw down the gauntlet to get, um, to get more debate going th by conducting this review and by the findings that, we have, uh, that have emerged from it. So moving on to the aims and methods, um, 
Our aims were to explore how knowledge about carers has been generated and developed since 1995. Um, and I can see people thinking, why 1995? Um, that was because that was the year of the Carers Recognition and Services Act, which is probably one of the most significant pieces of, of legislation, and it altered the character of services for carers and the way carers were treated. So we decided to go for that date. Another one of our aims was to try and synthesise the key dimensions of the carers research paradigm, to try and pull things together. Um, and we wanted to critique the relationship of research um, and the theories generated to our understanding of carers and caregiving in contemporary Britain. So that was our aims. In terms of methods, well, I could go into a lot more detail here, but we'd be here till after lunch. Um, so I've tried to just pull out a few key points about the methods, but if people want to talk to me more about the methods, um, I've got a draft of the paper, so I can, I can talk you through those afterwards. Uh, basically, it was a multi-stage review. We chose publications in terms of their relevance um, to these criteria, whether, and as you can see, there are many around reviews and evaluations of research and evidence, of theoretical knowledge, of conceptual knowledge, and reviews of analysis of knowledge relating to carers and, and, and care. We excluded publications before 1995, for the reason I said, um, and work that was non-peer reviewed. We also excluded work that wasn't written in English because we thought we might not understand it very well, but um, uh, that was an obvious one to go. And um, although we prioritised UK publications, um, we did look at seminal work from North America and Australia because a lot of the work um, around, um, well, a lot of theoretical work has come out of, um, from, from, from the, those particular countries. And, and just for clarification, a critical interpretive analysis uh, or, or synthesis is a systematic review methodology um, that offers a way of synthesizing a diverse range of um, evidence and it helps you to engage critically with it and to um, reflect critically on the nature of the knowledge generated. So, um, that's in a nutshell. So that's why we chose that particular methodology. So having um, carried out our, our, our study, we've, as I indicated at the beginning, we found that two distinctive paradigms emerged um, from our process, from this process, with different perspectives and different approaches. And they provided overarching frameworks uh, for locating and exploring a number of key themes that came out from <coughs> our, our critical interpretive synthesis as well. As, in, as you can see, the first uh, research paradigm we called Caring in the UK, Gathering and Evaluating. Uh, the second one we called Caring in the UK again, Conceptualising and Theorising. So I'd like to take um, each of these in turn and just talk through uh, the, the type of approach adopted in each one and the different themes that emerged and the sort of knowledge that is coming out of each or the, we found in each of these paradigms. So the first one, um, care, caring in the UK, gathering and evaluating, um, this primarily focuses on um, profiling the nature and extent of caring assessing the impact of caring and evaluating the effectiveness of um, care-related policy and services. And this is reflected in the three themes that are on this, this slide. So I'll take each of those in turn um, and illustrate the sort of knowledge generated within this par paradigm. So with regards to profiling, carers. This, the knowledge generated here um, provides evidence about the number of carers, um, that tell us about how many carers there are, how the demand for input from carers is increasing, 
Um, uh, the, the fact that three in five adults in the UK will become a carer at some point in their lives, um, and the increasing number are what we call will it have more than one episode of caring, and the term serial caring was used earlier on to, um, this morning. So and so more and more ser serial caring. It provides evidence about who they care for. Um, for example, that a quarter of all carers care for a spouse or a partner, um, more than half, that's 52%, care for their parents or parents-in-law, and 13% care for a disabled son or, dis or, or daughter. Tells us about the age profile of carers. We talked earlier on about more and more older carers. Um, we know that uh, carers are predominantly midlife women. Um, a quarter are aged over 65 years and around 2% of carers are young people. There's also evidence and um, information about the sort of tasks that carers undertake, like preparing meals, shopping, cleaning, administering medication, uh, personal care, and providing social and emotional support. And finally, um, within this theme, there's evidence and information about our spent caring that just under half of all carers provide care for 20 or more hours a week and that a fifth care for 50 or more hours a week. And in relation to this, the second theme, the impact of caring, there's evidence about carers' health. Um, for example, there was a study by the Royal College of General Practitioners in 2012 which estimated that 40% of carers experience what they call significant levels of distress and depression. Um, and the older carers who report strain, inverted commas, um, have a 63% likely, higher likelihood of death in a four year period than those who aren't carers um, or, or don't rep report strain. We've got information about uh, carers' capacity uh, to remain in work. Again, um, Elaine mentioned this and, and Helene has mentioned it too, that um, nearly th three-fifths of carers who are working end up giving up paid work to care. And this is estimated to cost them around 11,000, each carer, £11,000 per year. And the loss to the economy is estimated to be £5.3 there's uh, information about quality, carers' quality of life. Um, for example, many carers uh, experience what's called restrictedness, feeling isolated in a constant state of worry. Um, they can't leave their dependent relative. Um, and it's been found that four in 10 carers um, hadn't had a day off in one study um, for a year and a half. So uh, um, a lot of evidence about the the negative effects on carers' quality of life. In finances, um, because of, of a lowered income a, a, a being, uh, results from being a carer and the higher costs of um, caring, like for example laundry and heating expenses, long-term carers are at risk of considerable poverty. 74% um, of carers have been found to struggle with paying for essential items including food and 66% use their own, own services to pay for care for the person that they support. And interestingly with, within this theme there's also evidence about some of the beneficial effects of caring and these in, um, include a sense of giving back um, to the person that they're caring for um, and higher levels of subjective well-being. And there's also evidence that uh, stresses and satisfactions coexist within caring. And this relates, a good example comes from research on uh, young carers. Although, as I'm sure you're aware, they experience uh, considerable disadvantage, um, in, for, for example, in re, um, regard to education, they often value their role. Um, it gives, it's been found that it gives them a sense of pride and worth and accomplishment and also it gives them increased resilience. It's come from studies um, by uh, Becker and, and Hunt. 
The third theme within this paradigm is um, support for carers. And as, as we've heard already this morning, um, there's increased policy recognition, um, on a greater focus on carers' rights, and there's a number of intersecting policies um, that um, have been produced over the past few years and has continued to be um, produced, giving carers their right to have their needs assessed, um, to um, have their health and well-being monitored and protected, um, to access support, um, training and employment, and try and have a, a life outside caring. And the phrase, I think, in um, one of the, the um, national, uh, national strategies is live a life outside <coughs> caring. But studies that have been um, carried out show that many carers still um, are profoundly disadvantaged by caring. And the sort of information that came out from this uh, body of knowledge is that carers uh, routinely um, feel unsupported and powerless and marginalised. There's some uh, as, as work done by the Health and Social Care Information Centre um, that found that only 6% of all carers in England ever receive an assessment of need. The evidence about service effectiveness is quite mixed. Um, Counselling seems to impact most positively on, on self-related health of carers. And although carer support groups are very popular, um, the ev there's only evidence that uh, about their effectiveness for carers of people with dementia. Um, so um, sort of that really kind of flies in the face of what we as assume because um, Care, care support groups are, there's, are, um, um, are being developed all, all throughout the country and by different organisations. Then with regards to personal budgets, um, as you know, um, personal budgets for service users and uh, their carers are to be mandatory part of all care plans. And from April this year, um, people who are already receiving NHS continuing healthcare have a right to ask for a personal health budget. There's evidence that personal budgets do allow carers greater flexibility, but there are concerns that the management of the personal budgets increases their workloads and stress loads, um, and that they have in insufficient information to um, in, in managing them and when things go wrong. Um, and there's also uh, concerns uh, that have emerged from studies that have been carried out that older carers, for example, are disadvantaged by personal budgets and also those carers who are supporting relatives with very complex needs. So that's the sort of knowledge generated by the first um, paradigm that we identified through our critical interpretive synthesis. In contrast, the second substantive field of care-related research that emerged explores the conceptual and the th an experiential nature of care. And it aims to explore the, the thinking um, and, and generate more thinking and, and, and theorising about caring as an activity um, and as an integral part to human relationships and as a multi-dimensional concept. <coughs> So, taking the first um, theme here, conceptualising carers, and I apologise that this, um, the next two slides are fairly busy, but it was in order to keep, get the coherence and give you a, a clear overview of each issue that I wanted to address. Um, this body of knowledge can be credited for extending thinking about the concept of a carer and it shows that it's still a contested concept there's inconsistency in its usage um, and it's a label that many of those who actually do caring don't um, identify with and there's a, a study done by uh, some work done by Lloyd um, in 2006 uh, um, that found that nearly as, um, half half of all carers don't actually I am 
own the term carer. Some commentators argue that it's a bureaucratically generated um, term and making something that's a normal human experience uh, into an unnecessarily complex phenomenon. That's a quote, I didn't, that's not my words, okay. Um, this body of knowledge also gives us analysis of conceptual model, models employed by services and, and policy making, policy makers. Just to give you some examples, um, to illustrate the fact that this analysis it, um, points to the fact there's still conceptual confusion. Taking co-production, although co-production is meant to um, re-sculpt the relationship between users and carers, it's been criticised for not taking into account carers' needs and for viewing them much more as a resource. With regards to uh, self-directed care, um, not only is there evidence that some carers don't necessarily benefit and they're expected to do additional uh, roles, but um, the, 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 some of the negative effects have been disadvantaged by the fact that they were introduced at, the t at a time or very near to the time of austerity and are being implemented during a time of austerity. Then uh, uh, another conceptual model, uh, the idea of carers as members of the care workforce. <coughs> Within this body of knowledge, it's argued that the provision of formal care um, training by professionals is indicative of a shift towards conceptualising carers as members of um, the care force and having an ob obligation to learn and se a set of formal skills. And finally, um, the work within this theme about, conceptual, uh, conceptual, about conceptualising carers does shows that carers' experiences are shaped not just by their personal responses to caring, but by a whole range of uh, situational and structural factors. For example, the number of hours they spend caring, the length, the type of care, who they care for, what particular condition that person's got. Um, their access to formal services and their gender, age and race and sexuality. So for example, female carers report high levels of subjective burden and feel isolated and, and more obliged to give up work <coughs> than um, their male counterparts. Um, many older spousal carers care alone and unsupported because they believe in the, the the care contract that underpins their um, their marital relationship, and it leads them to, to, to resist the intrusion of outsiders, who, um, including services, that is. Um, and similarly, um, and I'm sure many of you have, 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 are familiar with this, many black and ethnic minority carers consider care, the concept of a carer and care, to be culturally inappropriate. Um, it's antithetical to, to family relationships um, and, and it is stigmatising to actually adopt that, um, this, this term, count, it's counter, counter to, to, to cultural um, understandings. So that's um, conceptualising and uh, conceptualising carers, the first of the themes within the conceptualising and, and theorising research paradigm. Moving on to um, the second theme, theorising carers. Because caring is integral to so many relationships, the di distinction between it being a normative activity that we would just do um, and as an activity that is beyond the normative, that is, is, is just something out, out of the ordinary, has driven, has in part driven a lot of theoretical analyses of um, care and caring. Um, and these, both on their own and together, and the way they kind of stimulated, kept, kept the debate going, um, have given us particular understandings of caring. And as I said, this, this slide is, is pretty busy, but if I split it up, you wouldn't get the, over, the overview that I, I want to give you. So I'll, I'll talk through each, each point um, on, the, on the slide. In the 1980s, we got the um, the idea that care is a homogenous activity, 
um, that it's based on the provision of instrumental support for one by one person doing care to another. In the 1990s, we started to get more feminist perspectives on care, and they obviously focused on the gendered nature of care, um, and challenged the care for care dichotomy, um, and started to look more at the relational aspects of care, the relationship between the person doing the caring and the caring, and the, mutual, the mutuality inherent in that. Other theoretical analyses that emerged um, during the 1990s were Kitte's um, idea of nested dependencies. Because she, uh, this, in, in this work it was argued that the mutuality and the attachment that characterises relationships um, um, lead to the conclusion that you, you can't, um, that we're all, we're all um, interdependent throughout our life co courses. And Kite, Kite argues that nobody is truly autonomous for long. Uh, independence is a pure state um, and it's neither realistic or desirable. Um, and so but we're all interdependent um, in, in, on, on someone else and dependent <coughs> on other people in our lives and they're dependent on us. Um, then there was the ethic of care um, this is, there's been a growing body on the ethic of care and Fiona Williams um, at Leeds has been um, doing work around this. Um, this. This work focuses on identifying the core elements of care and argues that it's fundamental to the social care, care giving care is fundamental to the social fabric of society and it binds together families and communities and it's embedded in all our personal and social relationships. So uh, an ethic of care provides um, a perspective to recognise both the challenges of caring um, and the significance of caring as a de as, as a, in terms of its part of human relationships, um, universal human relationships. Another th um, theoretical sort of development that occurred in the 1990s was came from the um, postmodernist interpretation of power and this emphasized the way that power in caring relationships is constantly changing and it's renegotiated um, through the interaction and therefore it's it's fluid um, and I've actually um, given you a quote here from some work by Dominelli and Gollins in 1997 here power in caring relationships is constantly recreated and renegotiated through interaction and is therefore fluid, complex and constantly shifting. So this is challenges the notion of caregiving um, as fixed and it also focuses on rela relationality and power within caring relationships. More recently, um, work has focused on the fact that the way care and caring change over time. Um, if you want to have a look, there's work by Bowlby here, um, and it's often in these changes occur often in to, in response to uh, uh, wider structural influences and policy changes. An example that's given is the way uh, care now is much more in the home. We've, we've, we've you know with the advent of uh, developments like community mation matrons there's more emphasis on caring for people with long-term conditions in home with with, with nursing needs um, so that's 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 again impacted on caring relationships it's not detached from policy developments um, that are going on outside that relationship and then other more recent work has talked about the spatially situated nature of cares is Edel here, um, 2013. This work argues that carers, where carers take the decisions about care, that influences their what they do as caring. And the work was done on carers' decisions about care in the home, and what when when that person, the person they came for, actually became into came was admitted to a care home. 
and it was found that because carers were caring in the home, they wanted they wanted to protect that privacy of their home. They didn't want people in intruding into um, what they would do for that particular per, the person they were caring for, even if they it was they needed extra help. So the, the, this study found that carers were actually doing a whole lot more because it was the privacy of their home. So the decisions they were taking were. Um, very strongly influenced the fact that they were caring at home. When these people were admitted to care homes in the, in the study, it's found that um, despite all the paperwork, these carers actually were are done far more than they're actually down for doing. Um, so there's that. This and this is re really recent work, and I'm sure will be developed. But I just wanted to give you a flavour of the sort of theorising that's um, been coming out recently. So once we carried out our critical synthesis, uh, critical um, synthesis, uh, we reflected on whether what the research that's coming out is actually about care, the research that's come out um, and the knowledge we're getting from carers' research is it actually doing the job it needs to do um, for for carers? Well, certainly. The growth in research about family care um, has raised the profile of carers uh, very much so um, that it's now prioritised as a significant <coughs> issue for social policy and practice. It's also uh, underpinned the development of the, um, the highly organised and effective and politically active carers movement. Um, and it's extended our understanding of care and caring. And in, and in terms of the relationship between the type of research and nature of knowledge, there is a very powerful and reinforcing link between the sort of research that um, we've got and the nature of the knowledge that we've got. It, it, you, they, they are very, very, very strongly linked. So given that, we thought it was important, Alice and I thought it was important to explore um, the different dimensions of the relationship in the two research paradigms that we found um, to get an understanding um, or, or to find out the implications of our understanding uh, about care and caring. So we evaluated each one in turn and we looked at its strengths and weaknesses and that's what I'm going to move on to now. Um, so taking the gathering and evaluating first, in terms of its strengths, it's clearly maintained carers inside um, the purview of government, um, and it's foregrounded caring as an issue of national significance. It's usually methodology, methodologically rigorous and trustworthy. <coughs> it's pretty well pretty easily accessed by a wider audience. I'll just flick to the next slide here. This is an example of the sort of organisations that are carrying out this sort of research, all of which are, are uh, have high profiles and have websites that are easily ac accessible. So just to flip back. Um, it does have the capacity to improve support for carers and also it has a cost effectiveness dimension which obviously um, addresses concerns of policy makers um, because it can offer an overall cost-benefit analysis of interventions or initiatives. But obviously it does have weaknesses. Sorry, I should go to the next one. Um, it's, the evidence base is pretty fragmented and une un uneven. Um, and there's a, we found that there's a lack of sustained cross-fertilisation between res research groups or funders. Quite often that can be attributed to the fact that people have to compete for funding for particular research. There's a lot of variation in the focus and the methodology and the nature and size of the projects. For example, there could be projects of, say, 12 young carers and then another project is a national evaluation. And these sort of weaknesses lead it to have a fairly weak additive capacity um, and also there's, we found there's quite a lot of duplication. It tends to only capture carers who are visible um, and uh, the, the, 
so those who don't self self identify as carers for the sort of reasons we've some of the reasons we've talked about just now and it's also been uh, criticized for being conceptually narrow and under theorized um, it's been criticized for for example taking snapshot views of, of, of caring um, and viewing caring as a fairly static process as fixed in time or space not not looking at the how caring evolves so turning to the the second paradigm and its strengths and weaknesses this paradigm tends to adopt a wide lens of analysis in relationship to care. It sees caring as embedded in um, ordinary relationships rather than just being an activity um, that one person does for another um, and bec because of ill health. Um, following logically on from that, it sees care as multi-dimensional, um, that it comprises both personal and social relationships um, and that it's a set of uh, ethical and moral uh, uh, values as well as, as practice. This body of knowledge also challenges uh, the more narrow definitions of carers that are used um, in the other research, looking at interdependent caring, caring as a, a series of interdependencies across our life courses um, and challenging uh, constructions of, of carers as having um, choice and control in, in all situations. And it also, this body of research roots research in the experiences of families um, and service service users showing um, the relational and the emotional um, dimensions of care that they matter as much and that it's not just the functional aspects of care that and if we improve the rate relational and the social aspects of care it, that can um, contribute to the well-being of carers as well and its weaknesses um, it does unlike the other um, body of knowledge, it does ha lack capacity to speak to an eco economic agenda. It has a, a more limited foothold in applied work and it has a weaker link to service and policy development in health and social care. And the last point, because it tends to be strongly grounded in a more sociological analysis, and obviously a lot of that's geared to the real, the real world, um, of, um, its association with sort of broader political issues um, it makes it more challenging to absorb into mainstream thinking about caring. So having carried out our critical interpretive synthesis um, and evaluated the findings, we drew some conclusions and it's these I move on to now. It's clear that research is central to extending understanding and generating knowledge about care and caring and to improving support for, for carers. And, and that was reinforced through our study. Our study also showed that um, carers and caring, the, the body of knowledge about carers and caring has two separate research <coughs> paradigms that have very different perspectives and approaches. And although they have an overarching, they share an overarching goal um, to improve the lives of carers, um, they don't necessarily, there isn't much synergy between them at all. And it was also clear that although there's been considerable investment in carer-related research, there's still many questions that um, are still unanswered or only partially answered. So we en ended up arguing that future research must build on the strengths of existing research and encor encourage cross fertilization to tackle the deficits of each one and build on its strengths. And we called for more critical reflection. This is the, we we just really, as I say want the, at the beginning we wanted to kind of get the ball go, going uh, rolling now. We we call for more critical reflection on um, care research and more debate and more analysis and more innovative research. And we felt that the findings from our our review um, um, that we carried out can be used to encourage this sort of debate. 
um, and, the and, and identifying the best way forward for care research in the future. And it's these sorts of debates that we need, um, to, we need for all our sakes, um, in order to address one of the most challenging and complex issues of the 21st century, and that's the near universal um, experience of caring and the increased depend our increased dependence on, on carers. So thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. Um, so I'm happy to take Great, Mary, thank you very much indeed. Oh, references, um, sorry. Yes. Um, <laughs> you, said it, you said at the beginning you were going to throw down the gauntlet, um, and I think particularly your conclusions mm. may be uh, where, where we might want to focus some of uh, the discussion. Mm -hmm. I've also learnt a new phrase, critical interpretative synthesis. <laughs> so I shall be using that to every available <laughs> opportunity uh, from now on. Not to uh, say when you had a glass of wine. Not to say when you had a glass of wine. <laughs> no. no, I struggle to say it sober, so goodness knows what it would be like after a glass of wine. Um, but really, really helpful. I think the, the, the use of those two paradigms to kind of think about um, how we're using research and the way it, way in which mm -hmm. it's structured is, is, is really helpful. Um, can I ask you just to start some questions, really? In terms of your conclusions, you, you, you said that actually you know, there's a lot of key questions that are unanswered. Um, and we, we need to do more to get that cross-fertilisation of research. Mm -hmm. For you, what are some of the key questions maybe that are unanswered and are really important in terms of, the, in terms of your perspective as a researcher? Mm -hmm. um, but also any thoughts on how we can get that better cross-fertilisation going? Well, as I pointed out, that one of the key things that emerged, although there's been a huge range of care research. Can you hear at the back? Oh, can, no, can do you, you mind? Yeah, do you want me to stand up? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, although there's been a huge amount of care research and very good uh, research, still so many carers are disadvantaged. Um, there's still issues, still people aren't identifying, not being assessed. Um, so it, it, it was those, it was the fact that carers are still disadvantaged that we've, I think we honed in on on particular, particularly, that's why we wanted we suggested the synergy between the two sorts of bodies of knowledge to try and address key issues for carers, and, and obviously working across disciplines as well w through that and with different organisations. And you mentioned funding, kind of the the, the competition for funding being mm. a bit of a barrier. Are there other barriers to that cross fertilisation? Do you think, or is that the, is that the key one in your in your view? There were several, but I'd be interested in what uh, what the audience think um, about. Um, the, the idea of the two different bodies of knowledge and, and ways that, that perhaps they could work together. Or okay, great. So yeah. over to you. Questions or comments on on, uh, on on Mary's presentation? Who wants to start? Oh. Okay. Hi, thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, just to kind of over, overcome the question, um, what sort of approaches do you think we should be using in terms of what's missing from what you found? So we've got all this information, but what, mm. what sort of hit you as missing? So. I think you might say that, for example, the longitudinal research is missing. Mm, mm -hmm. Are there any other things that... Do you all hear the question? No. no. So the question was, what's missing? Mm -hmm. um, and particularly, is it that longitudinal research actually is, is, is missing? It, that, that is one thing that was missing, because we, ha we kind of get a fairly static view of caring. But there's a whole host of issues around the relational aspects of caring. Um, and and also using insights from one body of knowledge to inform the other to sort of address to, to try and work together in order to in, in and, and and because we haven't done it yet um or it, it's just an, it's an idea we just felt that both bodies of research have so many strengths that they could actually merge together and synergize in order to to develop to, to address things like the lack of longitudinal research or um, the fact that um, so many carers don't self-identify or that people aren't coming forward for ass assessments. Okay, And also we felt that um, one of the, uh, an issue is that we, we, you know, then we need to keep a focus on carers. <coughs> um, with, with as, as as having their own sets of needs as well. I mean, I, mean, I, I hear what what's being argued. We, we're mainstreaming carers, but we also felt there needs to be the specific focus on on carers as a, a, a body of people within the population. Okay, thank you. Any other 
questions or maybe comments? Yes, so one here and then one there. Yeah. Just, just flagging up uh, from what you're saying now, mm -hmm. it just sort of triggers things in my mind. Caring is increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't pick up with the uh, previous speaker because perhaps it wasn't appropriate or there wasn't time. The issue of integration and the issue of how people are being moved into the community mm -hmm. away from healthcare mm -hmm. is increasing. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is putting the pressure on, again, mm -hmm. again on mm -hmm. the caring population. Mm -hmm. And not only increasing it, mm -hmm. but asking quite vulnerable people to mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. without mm -hmm. sufficient support. And I'm wondering how you're almost capturing that <coughs> changing environment which is actually so crucial because of the focus on implementation mm. today. We've been talking about it for years, yeah. but it's happening now, yeah. it's going to happen. Well, that's where we felt the, the synergy will work because the first body of knowledge doesn't capture the, the, how caring changes over time because yeah. of policy initiatives. That's where we thought if there was a great awareness of the wider structural and policy initiatives on caring and how that changes over time, that that would that would give us a better uh, idea yeah. of of the, the often profound implications yeah. for people, um, um, and particularly with the move to more people with long-term conditions exactly. staying longer and being kept out of hospital. Yeah. We yes, need very current information. Yes, don't we? we do. I mean, yes, ten years is doesn't it? Yeah. Actually, yeah, <laughs> and it's and it needs. It needs to be done as the policies emerge yes. as well, um, and because by the time the studies impact, you know, yeah, impact. impact. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. Really good point. Thank yes. you, Michael. Following on from the impact, the yes. Uh, did, did you identify? You, you talked about how research has made an impact. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last bit, Michael. You, you talked about how research has made an impact. Yes. In the area of keeping the, the profile of care. Yeah. And, and and bringing in improvements. Yes. Did mm. you, We didn't specifically, um, but I mean, I could just talking, sort of reflecting on the, what we did myself. It was keeping keeping carers in the public domain, keeping the profile going, and um, having funding for research um, and, and research specifically for carers um, to look at their own particular needs. Um, so yeah. The actual study itself didn't address that issue, but that's that's my kind of gut reaction from what, what we did. Yeah. Okay. Colour. Okay. Could, could, could. Sure, yeah. As I say, um, it was meant to start the debate. Yeah, yeah we did touch on the, the, the perspectives that you talked about, and I was just today I was just trying to give it a quick overview. But this is the sort of debate we wanted to in, encourage through this. It's not meant to be, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a scientific, obviously it was a rigorous study, but it's not a science, as you know. Um, and that's why I 
will welcome the opportunity to come and talk here to sort of pick up ideas like that and maybe take them back and hopefully other people could work on those sort of ideas as well so thank you okay any final questions or any other comments yes, yeah yes um I'm Derek Douglas, uh, Wandsworth Borough Council. Uh -huh. Sorry, I came in late. I had problems uh, getting here um, with public transport. Um, the publications you mentioned, post 95, 1995, mm -hmm. that you had a look at, did any of them, any of those publications, actually focus on people from minority ethnic groups in this country? Mm -hmm. And uh, if so, how is that? How did you find that, especially in relation to what you say with, with self identification being mm -hmm. an issue, particularly in some ethnic minority groups? How did you, uh, what did you find? What did you discover? Uh, well, I mean, it's a whole interesting, but we, I mean, I have to, as you can see from the, the slides, we went, we identified reviews of literature. Um, so we weren't sort of going into, into detail in lots of different studies. We were looking at particular reviews. Um, so, are you asking sort of what are the findings about carers from B, from well, what, minority groups? Yes. What uh, yeah. you, you may um, mention, you mentioned it, you mentioned about race. Yes, uh, uh, as an influence on 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 on, on, on caring. Yeah. You, this is you, but identifying yourself as a carer in particular. Mm -hmm. um, it's among ethnic minority groups, all of, all of things are changing, mm, mm. and that has always been an issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether or not in the recent, first I wanted to find out if there was a focus, if, if there has been any research mm. since post 95 that actually focus, or any publications actually focus on that group of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, if so, how, um, what, what those find, how those findings are going to influence the future, any future research. Right, in, in, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it's difficult to answer without actually spending time with you and showing what we what we found. Um, so, I mean, we ra I raised it in an issue in this sort of overview um, that that is a, a huge inf that is one of the influences um, ethnic um, which which minority group you belong to influences your experience of caring. Uh, but there's there's been masses of studies done. Um, so, we, I think maybe the best thing I can do is is send you. Some, go back to the review and send you some more details if you're interested. Um, yes, I, yes, I certainly am interested. Yes. Yeah. Um, one, one of the things, it's one of the issues we have in Wandsworth, and I suppose that's the same with many other mm -hmm. authorities, is um, not only engaging in mm. the first place with um, carers mm. on our views, but people actually coming forward mm. and saying, yes, you know, mm. I care, mm. um, I'm a carer. Mm. Although you can see they are cares it mm. them to self identify mm -hmm. is a major issue. Sure. And I suppose it's one that isn't limited in that uh, in mm. that area. Mm -hmm. So I want to get as much information as I can mm -hmm. to enable us to engage not in research, mm. not to engage in research, but in the very practical thing sure. of identifying, yeah. being able to identify mm -hmm. um, in communities yeah. what are the issues in mm. relation to people mm -hmm. coming forward mm -hmm. and saying yes, I don't care. Yeah. How you can go about tackling there's, there's several better, uh, I won't go into detail now because we'll talk later on, but there's several better health publications that are worth looking at. Okay, uh, so it yes. sounds like you two have got a date yes, I know, yes. to share yes, exactly. some further yeah, exactly. information. A really good question, and I think yes. teasing out some of that data. Yeah. And mm. you know, this is what today's partly about, is how research can then be useful in, in, mm. in practice. practice. Really important. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, sure. so a great yeah. opportunity yeah. made. For yeah. you. So uh, just a, a, a last it's, question here as well. Finishing a, a massive um, study where she's been interviewing people, uh, carers from ethnic and, and minority groups, and the the way they went about finding carers, they just couldn't get them to engage. Mm. So they went around every convenience store and stood at taxi ranks. And so far, they've interviewed about 150, mm. but they've just finished the interview and then they're rising up now because they're looking at ways to engage. In but th th there is actually the body of knowledge is actually strong and developing. It may not be as, as big yeah. as some of, on other other groups, but there's yeah. certainly a sound body of knowledge that's emerging. It depends which carer group it is. 
Because yeah. the other things mm. we tend to homogenize them, don't mm. we? Mm. Yeah. Mm. All, all carers are are the same, but mm. they're not. They're, they're different. They mm. have different needs. Yes. Yeah. And, and, yeah. So and we can't put, put can't put people into boxes. No, no. but mm. we do. Mm. You know, the first report in 1995, mm. the recommendations were from um, research on older carers, yeah. weren't they? And yet they were rolled out as for all carers, mm. and and that's still done. All they're, they're a carer, so they'll have X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Whereas a, um, a carer for an older person mm -hmm. has different needs to a carer for, for, for somebody with a learning disability. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the same, but and you know, at least at least the profile's being raised, mm -hmm. and it does keep it, it keeps changing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, twenty years ago, some um, particularly in in, in in some Asian uh, groups um, in the community. They saw caring as something that they had to do, that um, you know, it's part of the culture, it's past mm -hmm. and you, know, you don't get paid for that, that's, that's your lot. And the whole family do it. Yes, yeah. mm -hmm. and that has, that has changed. Yeah, that actually mm -hmm. I know has changed because I do have a uh, close association with it. But, and I think that's a really good point, how changing family structures, mm -hmm. uh, changes in society, you know, advances in technology, social mobility, all those things have a massive effect mm. actually. So it's a it's a constantly changing environment, isn't it? Mm. Um, and that's mm. why I think the issue around mm. the research being current and up to date and mm. impactful mm. is really is really important. Yeah. That otherwise you're kind of you're trying to go forward by looking in the rear view mirror of the car, mm. aren't you, as, mm. to, as to what's as to what's, as to what's, yeah. what's been. Mm -hmm. Michael, you want to come in? Yeah. School touch carers several projects that are BME. BME, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Some of which are also about the experience of the carers yeah. in those communities. So you check on the website. I don't know any of the projects have been brought in yet, but they should be coming out in the next few years. Great, thank you, Mike. Mm. So there's quite a lot to draw yeah. on there. I just want to leave you with a with a um, an example, really, about reaching people who who don't self-identify as carers. It's from um, we have a number of carers or former carers who. Uh, volunteer with us as carer ambassadors and one of the things that they do is uh, try and reach out to people who are caring but may not have uh, really identified in that way. And we heard a fantastic story um, a week or two ago um, about someone who who is a smoker, it's important that you know that this person is a smoker, and they were outside Euston Station. Now if you know Euston Station, outside Euston Station there's a bank that you have to go through of, of smokers. And she stood there pretending that she didn't have a light for her cigarette mm -hmm. so that when someone came along she said oh so you know can you give me a light because yeah. smokers understand that if you haven't got a light and you need a cigarette <laughs> it's really important she started chatting to them yeah and her purpose for doing that was to see if they were caring for someone mm -hmm. and in doing mm -hmm. that she found a number mm -hmm. of people who were caring and we've got a little postcard that you we can give to mm -hmm. people to say you know if, you, if, you're, mm -hmm. if you're looking after someone further information and in that really really simple way she actually uh, got into contact with a number of people who were caring, yeah. uh, but but hadn't thought of themselves yeah. in, in that way. We, we so I know it's not good on the public health piece around, <laughs> uh, around smoking, but really interesting how sometimes it's those very personal, very direct, very simple ways. Yeah. Innovative of as well. Innovative yeah. of, of reaching out in the settings that we're all in. And mm. actually the power of just having that conversation, saying, are you looking after someone? Actually, there are organisations that can help, mm. uh, there are entitlements that you have is, is really important. Mm. Mary, thank you so much uh, for that, for that really Pleasure. helpful overview, really thought provoking. Um, a good place to go into lunch. Um, so can we just thank Mary very much for this? Thank you. Thank you.